Our Story Production presents The Road to Our Story, spotlighting an in-depth look at many of The Road to Our Story magazine's featured articles. So get ready, for you're about to travel on The Road to Our Story. Hello, I'm Jason Howland, and welcome to Speaking of Health, a place to help you learn how to live a longer and healthier life. You know, concussions can be a common thing in sports, especially in professional contact sports, where athletes are bigger and faster. But head injuries and concussions can also happen in local sports with young athletes and also anyone with uh, just normal day-to-day activities. Here to talk more about concussions, our guest today on Speaking of Health is Josh Barrett. He is a Mayo Clinic Health System physical therapist. Josh, thanks for joining us today on Speaking of Health. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Look forward to this interesting discussion we're going to have. Well, let's start off the discussion by explaining what exactly is a concussion. People have probably heard of it, but a lot of people probably don't know exactly what it is. Sure. A concussion is classified as a mild traumatic brain injury. Uh, that typically occurs with a blow to the head, but doesn't have to be a blow to the head. You can also get a concussion with a blow to the chest and have a rapid deceleration or acceleration to the head. Uh, And essentially, it's an alteration of the physiologic process that's going on inside the brain or the brain's ability to function. It's not typically um, an injury to the skull or the anatomy of the brain that we can see with CTs and MRIs. And so it's more of an altered uh, functioning of the brain that uh, we're dealing with when we talk about concussions. But it is classified as a mild traumatic brain injury. The brain is a pretty delicate uh, organ, right? And, and so it probably sometimes doesn't take that large of a blow to, to do some sort of damage, right? Yeah, the, the brain definitely is something that needs to be protected and is pretty fragile. Uh, when we're dealing with blows to the head or the chest, there doesn't um, uh, need to be a loss of consciousness or a severe uh, a traumatic event to cause a concussion. Um, and that's kind of a, one of the misnomers that people have about concussions is it can be something very simple that happened in Fayette with a kid or, um, you know, the kid slipped off their bed and, and fell and, and just landed on the floor hard. Uh, those types, types of injuries can lead to concussions as well. Well, I, I've heard of the phrase, uh, I had my bell rung. Does that mean that you've had a concussion? We have seen uh, over the years with the, the different uh, uh, testing that we've done is that with a bell ringing phenomenon, you can be impaired with your brain's functional level for up to four to seven days. So most certainly just having your bell rung, seeing stars for that you know, 20 seconds after you got hit in football uh, can definitely lead to a concussion. Well, uh, what are some of the uh, common signs and symptoms of a possible concussion? Uh, Dizziness, blurred vision, uh, headache, uh, amnesia of the events that happened right before you got hit or right after you got hit, um, altered personality, uh, uh, numbness, tingling, uh, any of those uh, neurologic symptoms are are indicative of a possible concussion. So it can be a, a number of different things. It's not just one specific symptom that says, yes, you've had a concussion. It can be a a number of things. Most definitely. When we're dealing with the brain, the brain is responsible for many, many, many things that, uh, uh, that make us us. And so it can be your personality or your control over an extremity or numbness or tingling, like we said. So, um, it, it can definitely be a very wide range of symptoms that we're dealing with. So what should someone do if, uh, they think they may have had a concussion? Well, number one, if they have a coach, if they have athletic trainers, physical therapists, doctors on site, uh, they should notify them that they're not feeling right, that they're worried that they may have got um, or had a concussion. Uh, And then if they're not around, notify their, their parents and then go see a medical professional. Do those signs and symptoms that you were talking about, are those, uh, for the most part, immediate, or can they sometimes happen maybe after the fact? Uh, Yeah, definitely. Sometimes we don't see that uh, uh, occur right after the initial event, but it may be delayed in when they uh, begin to show themselves. So uh, you definitely can see symptoms later on that wasn't really, or that the symptoms weren't very obvious to start with. So uh, how can we help people that have had concussions? Uh, How do you treat a concussion? Well, first and foremost, it's rest, uh, removal from that current competition, uh, 
you know, do not allow them to go back and finish the game. Uh, and then, you know, some people with one or two days of rest, uh, followed by a graded uh, a return to, to normal activities is, is all they need. Um, it, it may be uh, just time. Some people uh, struggle to get over that hurdle and they may need a little more uh, help and guidance as far as returning to normal functional activities, uh, getting back out there and, and playing again. So um, it's a very individualized process and I think that's the main thing that we really have to focus on with concussions is that each athlete has to be treated or treated as an individual and there isn't one cookbook that really can uh, suit all of the concussions. Yeah, you know, the brain isn't like getting a scrape on your knee where you can put a Band-Aid on it. Uh, you know, the brain inside your skull, you can't reach it, so rest, best way to heal it, right? Yeah, it, rest, and, and the thing that we often forget is, is mental rest is key, too. Uh, we advocate removing them maybe from school for a day or two so that they're not taking a calculus test the day after because that's just as taxing on the brain as you know jogging around the block for for a half hour so um, kids hate to hear we want them to take their cell phones away you know no video games uh, remove them from school for a day or two and just let them rest initially both with the mental and the physical aspects I know for um professional sports like for example the NFL they have certain rules for concussions on when an athlete uh, can return to the field. Are there things like that for say high school athletes, young athletes? Uh, yes, we essentially follow the same protocol that the NFL uh, system uses. We want them to um, return to symptom-free activities. Uh, they have to pass a neurocognitive test. We use the impact test uh, which is a neurocognitive test assessing the brain's uh, functional abilities, whether it's a memory, reaction, processing, things like that. They have to return to their baseline exam and then return to non-contact drills without symptoms and then return to contact drills without symptoms. And then we're uh, going to allow them to return to their current sport. Can you give uh, an example of, of how the test works uh, and what you do with that test? Sure. The impact test is uh, the test that we use, and it's a neurocognitive test that we give to all of our athletes prior to their season. So we want to get a baseline level of how their brain uh, processes, uh, how good their memory is, short and long term. Uh, we show them shapes, uh, very elaborate shapes. Then we distract them with certain uh, activities with the mouse. And then we ask them, was this one of the shapes that you saw? Yes or no? And it will um, assess their ability to remember the, the spatial orientation of the shapes. We have uh, reaction uh, um, and processing times with mouse clicks to certain colors. Um, they have to count backwards from 25 that will distract them. And then they're asked to recall certain uh, words that they saw. So it's really more of a, a brain uh, processing test that they take at baseline. And then that's the same test with different shapes, different words, then again, that they'll take after an injury so that we can assess whether or not they return to their baseline level of function. So are there risks for people who may, or athletes that may return to the field too soon after having a concussion? And what are those risks? Uh, most definitely. The, the number one thing that we're trying to prevent is uh, a second injury. And there's a term called second impact syndrome that is a, a fatal condition that uh, occurs when an athlete goes back to play before their brain is recovered from the first concussion. Uh, if they haven't recovered fully, their brain is much more susceptible to a second, more severe injury. Uh, there were 40 cases in the last 10 years in the U.S. that led to death after a concussion uh, where an athlete went back to play too soon. So that's the, the number one ultimate thing that we're trying to, to prevent when we're dealing with uh, concussions and return to play. Also, uh, they may have second, third concussions that leave them with permanent um, uh, brain injury uh, signs and symptoms as well. So things that, that never do get better in those are the, the severe cases that we're really trying to, to avoid and, and make sure our athletes are the safest. Are there ways to avoid concussions to prevent a concussion from happening? Uh, number one, you know, is having the right equipment and using the right technique. Uh, coaches can really assist us when they're teaching kids how to tackle or how to check in hockey, that they're not uh, using their head as a weapon. Uh, they definitely need properly fitting uh, helmets and pads. Um, outside of that, Concussions do happen. They're part of sport with kids being faster, uh, stronger, uh, participating in sports at a much younger age. Uh, things are going to happen, and we know that, that we can't prevent all concussions. Um, but with proper coaching, proper techniques, and proper equipment, we can see uh, concussions reduced.
So Josh, uh, I would think that education is really key for something like concussions where it's not a visible injury. Education is really important, right? Yeah, most definitely. We've found uh, through some of the programs that we've instituted within the Mayo Clinic Health System that education is first and foremost when you're starting a program off. We had to reach the coaches, the parents, the kids, uh, and the physicians and the healthcare team that cares for these individuals and make sure everyone's on the same page. They all understand the risks of uh, concussions and the purpose um, that the program is being instituted for. Uh, once they realize that we're there to protect the kids and ensure their safety in participation with sport, then everyone can be on the same page and really buy into the program. Uh, if you just um, left that portion out, they think that we're trying to prevent their, their child from playing in the game that can help them to the state tournament. And mm -hmm. that's really not the case. We're trying to ensure that they return at the safest level that they can, um, but yet participate too, because that's what sports is all about so and that's probably the one of the most difficult things about a concussion I would assume is because it's not a visible injury that uh, a parent may think you know Johnny's fine look at him he's he's doing he's doing great he can go back out on the field or on the court but sometimes that's not the case yeah exactly and that was always the the trouble with the old system that that we try to use is that they wanted to classify it as a mild or moderate or severe concussion. Was it your first, second, or third? Then you should sit out one week or two weeks. The, the CT scans, the MRIs that were taken were normal 97% of the time because they were assessing for uh, cranial fractures or uh, hemorrhages in the brain, very severe issues. But concussions never showed up on those images. But parents thinking, oh, they took an MRI, my, it was normal, my kid is fine. Um, it was really hard to convince them. So that's where it's really important that they have a neurocognitive test to assess their brain function before we can let them go back and play. And I often have the parent sit with the child looking over their shoulder during the test just so that they can see how well they do on the test. And sometimes it's very enlightening for the parent to see, wow, I can't believe that they struggled with that as much as they did. Because like you said, you don't notice some of those things in just day-to-day -day ADLs, such as eating breakfast in the morning. That has changed a lot in what, say, the last five, 10, 15 years? Yeah, it's really a, an evolving uh, science. Uh, there's a lot more data now than there ever was before. Uh, but I would say about five years ago, uh, the impact software became readily available to all high schools and, and colleges through uh, their system. There are other programs out there that are in use as well. We happen to go with the impact software because it's easy for us to use and accessible. Um, but yeah, definitely about the last five years, we've seen a, a lot more attention to concussions and attention to the management of concussions. And we've seen uh, successful uh, outcomes as well. So it's been been very exciting to see. Let's say an athlete um, um, may or may not have had a concussion during a sporting event. You said to, to talk to the trainer or the coach or, or a parent um, if they um, suspect that possibly they have had a concussion. From there, is it a trip to the emergency room or do they see their doctor uh, the next day or how does that work? Sure, that's a great question. You can never be too safe. So when in doubt, definitely I would encourage them to go to the ER. If it was just a bell ringing incident where I saw stars for a little bit and now I'm, I'm feeling okay, but I'm a little, um, just you can feel out of sorts. You know, I don't think that warrants a trip to the ER, but if they're having, you know, uh, lethargy, uh, altered uh, sensation into their limbs, um, you know, throwing up or vomiting, that's definitely a, a time where they should go to the ER. Um, but, but for the most part, if it was just a mild uh, concussion, uh, it's not uh, an emergency and they can follow up with their family physician the next day. Uh, we're lucky because we work very closely with our family doctors and they um, support our program very well. They have a very good understanding of what we accomplished with uh, the, the testing, the impact uh, software, and then the, the graded return to play progression that they go through. So that's a very good partnership that we have and it's uh, definitely a key component to a good program. So Josh, are there, are there certain people that may be more susceptible to getting a concussion? Sure, uh, it's interesting you, you ask that. We see, um, uh, number one, women or young gals tend to be a little more uh, vulnerable uh, to concussions. And, and, and if they have had a concussion, they take a little bit longer time to recover. Um, the other thing is that they found through studies that uh, people have a genetic predisposition to um, sustained concussions. And so maybe a severe blow to one child did not result in a concussion at all. And then a more mild uh, a play in football or a check in hockey results in a concussion that is pretty uh, debilitating to another child. So uh, 
that again, I can't reinforce enough how each child has to be managed individually and uh, each concussion is its own separate uh, event that we have to really um, manage against their own background data. Well, thanks, Josh. This is all great information. Uh, hopefully uh, a lot of parents learned uh, some more about concussions out there and, and we can help uh, some of the kids that may be possibly experiencing concussions and don't even know it. Yeah, no problem. It's my pleasure and uh, uh, I enjoy talking about this stuff. So. Feel free to ask any more questions if you need anything. All right. And thank you for joining us today on Speaking of Health. Have a great day and be healthy. There you have it, folks. One of the favorite stories ripped from the pages of The Road to Our Story magazine. Let's have a look at another. Our Story Productions presents the Cockover Morning Show, where we weed out the big stories from throughout Sweet Swine County with Bobby Ray and Sally Sue. Thank you, and welcome to the Cockover Morning Show. And what a show oh, we have today. Let me tell you oh, what. it's that, amazing. That is for sure. And I tell you what, Sally Sue, I want to tell you what a weekend I had. Oh, well, yeah, I'm sure that well, that you, you know, are going to share your wonderful weekend. Hi, you weekend. know I yeah. am. You know yeah, I am. I Sally Sue, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for Bobby Ray Weekend Adventures. Sally Sue, you won't believe what I went to see this weekend. Really? The Sheldon Theater in Red Wing. Oh. So let me tell you, the public-private partnership that created the Sheldon Theater began at the start of the 20th century when Theodore B. Sheldon, a successful businessman and Red Wing City Council member, bestowed $83,000 in trust to the city of Red Wing. Wow. Along with the funds, he stipulated that the money was to be used to develop a public institution for some public benefit, but not sectarian, but non-sectarian purpose in the said city of Red Wing. So he's really? pretty specific, yes, wow. yes. When the theater first opened, the interior was such a celebration of arches, delicate plaster, sculpture, decorative painting, and many other rich detail elements that it caused the Sheldon to be described as a jewel box. Oh, I bet it's beautiful. It's, it's gorgeous, oh, beyond description. Beautiful. This grand venue played host to large traveling shows which were prevalent in those days, as I'm sure our producer can relate to as, because of his age. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but the 1929 stock market crash and the advent of films led to the demise of such entertainment. In 1936, the theater underwent a major renovation to make it an appropriate venue for moviegoers. Unfortunately, little thought was given to preserving the fine architectural details of the original theater during the series of changes. In the 1970s, as competition from multi-screen movie houses and television increased, and the Sheldon's operating revenues decreased, the city began to consider alternative uses for the theater. Okay. Well, that's good. That's yes, indeed. Good. They're always that's looking good. to yeah. reuse it. Yeah. A special task force in 1984 began to study the idea of restoring the theater to its original elegance and using it as a home for live performing arts. <gasps> Wonderful. Yes. In 1986, the citizens of Red Wing passed by an 85% majority of the vote. In all, $3.5 million was generated for the restoration of the theater and the endowment of its future. The theater was closed to the public and restoration began in 1986. The totally restored Sheldon Theater again opened its doors to the public, this time as a showcase for the best local, regional, and national arts and entertainment. Because the original second and third floor gallery area were converted to a multi-image screening facility and technical area, theater seating has been reduced to 466 seats. I don't um, think that's a no, small number, no, okay? No, I don't think so either. But in wow. every other aspect, the theater has been has returned to its original 1904 design, Good and it them. is outstanding. Oh, that's amazing! So there you have it. It was a great weekend and a great adventure. So, um, you know, I anyway go right ahead. No, no, I think that's exciting. I, I kudos to them for, for doing that and 
and because more communities need to do that. Absolutely. Too many times we take those treasures and we yes. discard them like yesterday's news. And in this particular Definitely. case, the community stepped up and preserved a real treasure it's in good. Red Wing. Good yep. for them. That was exciting. Well, Sally Sue, there you have it. Bobby Ray, Weekend Adventures. Wow, that was exciting, yes, honey. Yes, it was. Yes, oh. it was. And speaking of exciting. Yes. You have to introduce our next guest. I'm going to, oh. but my goodness, this wine on our table, I mean, what's up with that? Our guest. Oh, that's our right, guest? that's right. Okay. Introduce him I would and love you'll know. to. I would love to. Ladies and gentlemen, from Fieldstone Vineyard in the town of Redwood Falls, Minnesota, please welcome Charlie Quast. <laughs> Welcome, Charlie. Glad Thank to have you, you here, Thank and you. I'm glad to see that you brought some of, uh, well, Sally and Susan, my best friends. Absolutely. Uh, so what do you, well, this is just marvelous. I mean, and we actually have a couple bottles that are open. Maybe we should uh, kick things off. What? By, a, uh, I think it's a great <laughs> look at that. I think that's a great idea. It's wonderful. They see absolutely, stone absolutely. And I don't know of oh. anything better in the morning than a little eye opener. Okay, we're going to do more than that. Oh, okay. Well, here. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't mean to shortchange it. Just say when. That's okay. okay Sally Sue. Oh, did you want some too, Charlie? Oh, uh, sure. I'll take I'll a little bit of that Frontenac. The Frontenac Rosé would be great. Yes, Charlie. <laughs> there you go. Not a big and enough this glass. this is the Frontenac Rosé. And yep. what is that one? This one is... Uh, I that don't is a Frontenac Gris. They're both oh, okay. uh, semi-sweet. That has a little bit of peach and apricot on the tail Ooh. end. Oh, and what is uh, this? That is going to have a little bit more uh, black or candied cherry. Oh. Uh, maybe a touch of cranberry with this year's vintage. And Ooh. it says this wine pairs well with pasta, burgers, and other grilled meats. Ooh, what does this one pair with? Uh, anything that you'd like. Well, how about just alone? Yeah, alone, oh, is, alone is fantastic. Cheers. 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 Very glad to have Very you on the set pretty. today. Look at that. Yes, Very absolutely. Nice. They're, mm. they're both grapes that were developed right here in Minnesota at the University really? of Minnesota. Mm, that's so that's something that we kind of concentrate on at Fieldstone is, is trying to grow as much um, from the University of Minnesota or cold hardy uh, climate grapes as we can. Uh, we think we're one of the largest uh, wineries in the state right now nice. um, in terms of percentage of production for um, Minnesota grown uh, grapes, which we're pretty proud of. So now when did Fieldstone Vineyards begin? We started in uh, 2003 with the actual first offering of the 2002 vintage out to the, to the general public. Uh, we were located uh, about four miles uh, west of Morgan, Minnesota. Um, and now just recently, uh, starting in 2010, uh, we, um, early in 2010, we started the renovation of the, uh, Fort, the historic Ford garage in downtown Redwood Falls and we oh, moved into oh. a new facility uh, at the beginning of last year. So Now, you started in 2003. How long does it take for the grapes to mature or get to a point where they're eligible or ready for wine, I guess that would Yeah, say. no, fair question. Three <clears throat> or four years, okay. um, you plant and you sit and you look and you have your neighbors uh, jab at you a lot. And I'm sure there's a, <laughs> a bunch of folks in Sweet Swine County that would do the same. What are you growing out there yeah. in those tubes? And uh, I used to have grow tubes and, and they finally start coming up out of the grow tubes. And about three years in is when you get your first probably lighter harvest. Um, the fourth or the fifth year would be when you get a larger, more meaningful harvest. Now, do you have a number of people involved at Fieldstone Vineyards? Uh, uh, it's myself right now and uh, a partner who is the winemaker, Mark Wedge. Uh, okay. We started as a, a family business with my father-in-law and my brother-in-law who are no longer uh, involved, but um, it was the four of us in the beginning. Uh, right now, the last couple of years, it's been uh, Mark and I uh, running the facility and the winery right in downtown Redwood Falls. Outstanding. So now, do you uh, provide a tasting room and Abs tours? absolutely? If, uh, if, yeah. if folks are venturing outside of Sweet Swine County, uh -huh. they uh -huh. can uh, stop by. Um, we offer up um, all of these wines oh, plus yeah. a few others mm. um, that they can come in, um, taste. Uh, there's a, a nominal charge of five bucks. We're generally pouring at least eight or uh, nine, or maybe even ten or twelve wines. Mm -hmm. They get to keep the wine glass. So you can bring that back and, and use that again. Oh, um, we have uh, food available for order and purchase there, and you can sit down and kind of oh, relax really? and kick back. And have to use yes. my Cocklebur Morning Show expense account for that. Oh, yeah. I suppose a limo will take you there. Too. Possibly. If you're nice, you might ride too. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Are these wines available outside of the vineyard? In other words, do you do you market these through local liquor stores or anything such as that? Or? Absolutely. Right now, Billy Ray, we're probably in about 100 and 125 liquor stores. Outstanding. Wow. That's around. great. That's a yep. big commitment. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, absolutely. So we sell them. You, you can stop by the winery and obviously buy uh, a bottle, or we hope you buy more than a bottle. Sure. Uh, case, if you will. Uh, but then we also do uh, wholesale out to those liquor stores. So, wow. yeah. Well, pretty large area, and, and we also in the state uh, can ship you wine. If you go to our website, I was just at, going to ask yep, about that. FieldstoneVineyards.com. You can order up there. I also noticed that on, on Ooh, this uh, info card that you have that you're also on Facebook. Facebook X. at uh, Fieldstone Vineyards and Twitter at uh, Fieldstone. And we just got hooked up now with uh, Foursquare, and we're doing some more promotion with uh, some of the Facebook stuff. And if I talk yes. any more on that, I'm going to be lying. Because <laughs> I, I, I don't know a whole lot more about that. I'm, I'm old enough not to, uh, not to have been in the know uh, necessarily. Now, one of the uh, fun things that I've participated in in another vineyard has been a grape stop. Do you do that? We, uh, I'm so surprised. You guys yeah, should both come up and, uh, and, and go into some costume in September, the third weekend in September. Third weekend. Yes, okay. we have a very large grape stomp that we've um, uh, joined with the Redwood Falls Fall Festival. Oh. Um, and fun. last year was the first annual. Um, uh -huh. We have even a bigger and better um, stomp planned and are in the process of planning for this September. So we're nice. really looking forward to that. That is, uh, there was hundreds of people that came into downtown. We're hoping to get thousands of people this year sure now i see you know a lot of these are have the names um we've got the whining farmer uh the whining farmer's daughter and and wife. Yes, the what waiting is the story farmer's wife. behind that? There has to be a story. Well, we, we started out with uh, the wines uh, that you have uh, in front of you that have the Fieldstone branded sure. label, if you will, uh -huh. uh, like that. Okay. And um, several years in, we had a grape that basically She's was so used like for that. juice and for jellies and stuff sure. like that. And I kind of cajoled uh, my partner, the winemaker, into making a wine from it, which he begrudgingly did, but it promptly sold out. That was the whining farmer. <laughs> so after he kind of, you know, probably as, as you have some farmers in Sweet Swine County, yes. he kind of batched it for a few years. Uh -huh. And we thought, you know, we should really get him hooked up and, and maybe have him settle down. And so we got him married to the whining farmer's wife. Uh, and that is another uh, semi-sweet. Um, yeah, now she's, but she doesn't, she doesn't look semi-sweet. <laughs> well, you know, if you take the, uh, the apron and the, and the dress uh, and maybe well, change it around a little yeah. bit. But now the and then they and, had the yeah. they had the daughter they know, had the right. daughter. Yes. Yes. He keeps looking at the daughter. Well, no, I was actually oh, no. Re I was looking at the the, the clearness of the wine. Oh, the, the daughter <laughs> took the best of both the mom and the dad. Of course, of course. So that has been kind of a fun. Um, the beauty of the mom yes. and the brains of the father. I understand completely. Or vice versa, it depends on. Or vice person. versa, yes. yeah. However, you'd like to look at that. That's been a, that's been a fun line of wines for us as well. Um, they're kind of tongue in cheek. Uh, we really like the the daughter. Uh, this is the first year that we've had the daughter out. That's our dry white that's made from a Saval Blanc grape. Um, the the wife is made from Brianna, which is you get a little bit more melon and there's mm -hmm. some semi sweet nice. stuff going on there. Uh, we describe the whining farmer as kind of the peanut butter and jelly um, wine, if okay. you will. It's very, you know, lowbrow, um, mm -hmm. very grapey uh, uh, wine. And Absolutely. Okay, so now I see on here calendar events. Do you have certain things that you do throughout the year? Matter of fact, uh, on the way in this morning, I had a conversation with a gentleman that is talking about coming in to do a uh, wine sensory perception um, uh, evening really? for us where you can come in and you pour this in the glass and he'll explain what it is that your nose and your taste buds mm. and all that oh, stuff nice. uh, is uh, getting. Well, Charlie, I'm sorry to say, but um, we are out of time. And we also want to thank you, our viewers, uh, for watching the Cocklebur Morning Show, where we do all we can to weed out the big stories from throughout Sweet Swine County and beyond. Till next time, bye-bye.